So welcome everybody. Um, I am Shannon Egan. I'm the director of Schmucker Art Gallery. And welcome to the very last virtual gallery talk of the semester we've had. Um, we'd have, we've had several of these and um, it doesn't take the place of you know, gathering together in person, but um, but I really, really appreciate you all being here today. I know we're all a little bit Zoom fatigued. So um, yeah, just so grateful for your willingness to log on and connect this afternoon. So today is the second part of the virtual gallery talks held in anticipation of the exhibition from the Yellow Springs to the Land of Immortality which is curated by 15 fantastic art history students um, under the direction of Professor Yansun, and it's scheduled to open in Schmucker Art Gallery on February 5th, 2021. Um, so please mark your calendars and come, if, if we're able to come to the gallery and we will also have um, hard copies of the exhibition catalog available in February when the show opens. All of the objects you'll see this afternoon and in the exhibition are from Gettysburg College's special collections and college archives. And I just wanna thank uh, Carolyn Sauter, Catherine Perry and Karen Drickimer for all of their efforts making this exhibition possible. The students who presented their work on Wednesday afternoon did a really amazing job. And so we are in store for another hour of um, really interesting research and analysis. So I just wanna congratulate Professor Soon and all of the students on their hard work, especially given the difficult and stressful circumstances of this semester. And so finally, before I turn it over to Yan for um, additional introduction, I just want to let you know that these talks are being recorded and will be made available on the college's YouTube channel. Um, I will be helping to moderate the questions at the end of the talk. So if you have a question or comment and do not want to appear on video, please type your question in the chat box at any point throughout the talks. Um, and finally, please join me in um, giving a virtual hand clap to uh, Professor Yansun and the students. Thank, thank you, Shannon. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I think I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, a few individuals to really make this, you know, exhibition possible. Uh, we thank, you know, uh, Shannon, you know, really came up with the idea for this, you know, wonderful, you know, exhibition. Uh, Caroline and uh, Caroline Satter and Megan Smith and also Catherine Perry from, you know, the library for their great support for, you know, student, you know, uh, research. Okay, I'm going to share uh, the screen to show a few installation views for the um, exhibition. And then we'll turn uh, to student uh, presentation. All right, so I think I need to backward a little bit. Sorry. Okay, are you guys able to see my slide? Okay, so this is actually the uh, beautiful installation uh, view for you know the exhibition. Uh, thank you know uh, Shannon and also you know Sydney. Uh, to put up, you know, this uh, beautiful, you know, uh, exhibition for the class. Uh, there are also a few uh, close-up uh, shots for the um, uh, cases uh, with uh, objects, you know, on display in the gallery. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to fast forward a little bit uh, to today's uh, presentation. All right, okay, so Sophia, are you ready? Great. Okay, um, so this white jade belt clasp, the uh, upper one is a 20th century reproduction, probably modeled after one that belonged to a wealthy or high ranking person in the Ming Dynasty. It's remarkably similar to a Ming Dynasty jade belt clasp excavated in Guiyang, China which is the lower one. Um, so this clasp was probably inspired by one similar to the Guiyang clasp. We can assume it belonged to someone of high status because of the jade material, which is rare and very difficult to carve and also the decorative motifs. The clasp depicts two archaic style dragons interlaced between swirling clouds and lingji fungus. Um, which are the scroll-like shapes near the dragon's heads. 
The decorations are raised from the base of the clasp in a complex open work design and detailed with incised lines. Jade is the second hardest stone on earth, so to create a work with this complexity and open work design is impressive. The model for this piece would have also been carved without modern tools, requiring a skilled craftsman and many hours of hard work. The labor required to produce jade objects contributed to its expense and therefore its accessibility only by the wealthy. During the Ming Dynasty, the most common accessory was the belt, which indicated official rank and was used to convey sociocultural messages about the wearer. As such an important part of the wearer's identity, these belt clasps were often buried with the owner to continue to express the wearer's rank and class in their afterlife. The materials of Ming belt clasps were regulated with jade reserved only for the emperor, empress, top officials, and imperial concubines. And then receding ranks had their own designated materials such as rhinoceros horn, bird horn, or bronze. Belt, belt clasp decoration also denoted official rank with different animals designated for each rank. This clasp is decorated with the openwork dragons, um, which are a symbol of power, beneficence, rain, and the growth of vegetation. The image of the dragon was regulated in the Ming Dynasty sumptuary laws, so dragons were only seen on high-ranking officials' belts. The symbol of the powerful dragon was fitting for a high-ranking officer. And then the combination of dragons and clouds on jade belts as seen in this one was further regulated. It was only allowed to be worn by emperors, empresses, princes, and princes bro or emperor's brothers. So we can guess that the model for this class belonged to someone very important. The Lingji fungus symbolizes good omen and water and was thought to give longevity and immortality to anyone who ate it. The combination of clouds, lingji fungus, and dragons on this clasp are represented in symbolic harmony because all three are emblems of water. These symbols would have been auspicious for the wearer. So this jade clasp, belt clasp functions as a memento of status and political rank in the Ming Dynasty. It's made of a precious regulated material and decorated with the regulated dragon and cloud motif and auspicious lingji fungus. So the model for this reproduction certainly would have made the wearer stand out and declared his honored status both on earth and in the land of immortality. Thank you. Thank you. Should I just start going? Okay. Yes. Um, okay. What we have here is a jade sash garment hook that defined the empirical hierarchy during the, Qing, the Qing dynasty. The sash garment hook is sleek in appearance, made from the precious mineral jade. It emulates a faint pale green glow, the dimensions being one inch by five inches. The hook incorporates two jade dragons that face each other in a parallel stance. Each dragon on the hook visually depicts intricate carvings consisting of the main scales, eyes, and their bodies modeled in the movement of the letter S. The gap between the two mouths of the dragons is used to facilitate the fastening onto an imperial robe. This jade sash garment hook closely resembles jade garment hooks worn on elite robes during the reign of Emperor Qianlong. As mentioned, this hook is carved from the material jade. Jade derives from a natural mineral linked with spirituality in decorative art and in ritual. It was often fashioned onto similar hooks, belts, jewelry, and dress ornaments. Thought to symbolize good luck, prosperity, renewal, longevity, and immorality, jade was considered a lucky stone, referred to as the stone of heaven. All jade decorative ornaments, when worn in dress, were representative of the identity of the wearer, worn in that by them in hopes to personally emulate these powerful symbols. The presence of jade in the household and in clothing indicates the wealth status of the individual who obtains it. Emperor Qianlong was known to be fascinated with jade, obtaining a vast collection. He often wore jade ornaments from his collection on his everyday imperial dress. Thought to have magical qualities that spread onto the wearer or possessor, only the emperor and imperial family could wear jade as a decorative ornament. 
The symbols emulated when worn were so powerful that they were deemed not available for the portrayal by members of the public. Jade, when carved into a dragon, was considered a lucky symbol and bringer of wealth. The dragon is credited with the power of transformation, the material jade thought to assist in the ascending into heaven. The dragon is known as the most significant creature in mythology, and the emperor is considered the son of heaven, which theoretically make the two equivalent in status and importance. The emperor permitted himself to wear the five-clawed dragon, while everyone else was to represent the four-clawed dragon. The precious mineral jade, when joined by the symbolic dragon on hooks like this, are representative of status, separating one member of the Qing dynasty from another. It is likely that the wearer of this jade garment hook, no matter in life and death, is someone who obtained an elite, even imperial position in the Qing dynasty. Thank you. All right, this one's mine. Okay, this jade cicada is a humble but charming miniature carving. The material, a dark green jade, is dappled throughout with brown and gray spots, which appear to have great depth when viewed in light. Like many jade sculptures in Chinese art history, the material was chosen due to its intrinsic quality, um, which has the similar uh, colored patterns on real cicadas, as well as historical significance. Jade was a material which held spiritual properties and would often be found buried with the deceased. Um, an appropriate choice for a sculpture of a cicada. The cicada is said to represent rebirth and immortality, owing to the cicada's unusual life cycle. Cicadas burrow underground after hatching and lay dormant for a period as long as a decade or more. Once they have fully grown, they will emerge from the earth and fly off, producing that nostalgic buzzing sound we hear in the summertime. Ancient Chinese people saw these mysterious insects emerging from the dirt as a magical and unexplainable event, and connected the cicadas with the concept of uh, rebirth. Uh, jade cicadas were used as funerary goods and connected to um, the symbolic meaning of life and death as far back as the Han Dynasty, which is 206 to 581 CE, or even earlier. These pieces would often be found in the mouths of the deceased, perhaps in the hope of the spirits um, one day emerging from their tombs, just the same way cicadas emerge from the ground at the start of summer. This piece was not likely a funerary gift, but instead a descendant of it. The symbolic importance of cicadas evolved over time. So by the Ming Dynasty, uh, 1368 to 1644 CE, when this piece was um, likely sculpted, it um, was probably not intended to be a grave good, but rather a piece for the living to enjoy, possibly as a pendant. However, interestingly, the dating of this piece in particular um, is debatable. An interesting note was found included with this piece upon its purchase and entry into the Gettysburg collection, um, indicating that the previous owner suspected it belonged to the Song Dynasty, which is 960 to 1279 CE. According to the records and special collections, this jade cicada was purchased from coal galleries in New York, New York in 1951 by Professor Kramer. On the back of the invoice is a description which reads, one jade cicada, undoubtedly Song, but to save argument, call it Ming. One gets the impression from this note that the previous owner had some debate with colleagues about its date. Indeed, looking at the stylistic differences of jade cicadas between the two dynasties, it is possible that this piece was created in the later years of the Song Dynasty or the early years of the Ming Dynasty. Um, the key to this estimate would be the holes drilled in the front of, oh, sorry, I skipped a line. Yeah, can we look at, thank you, okay. Um, Um, the key to this estimate would be the two holes drilled in the front of the piece, which indicate that it may have been worn as a pendant, something more common to the Ming Dynasty than to the Song Dynasty. I've included um, a comparison of two other jade cicada sculptures and will allow you to visually compare the pieces. As you can see, they all have similarities, but the Song Dynasty sculpture on the left um, is much smoother and simplified, whereas the Ming Dynasty carving on the right is more detailed and has a loop um, through it for a cord. In accordance with my research, I date the cicada in the Gettysburg collection to the Ming dynasty. Um, and if we could proceed to the next slide, this is, I apologize for the quality of this picture, but this just shows that our cicada indeed has two holes drilled in the front, which probably had a cord inside of them. The 
this is it. I'm good. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so the piece that I researched was the tongue tube. Um, so standing at just four and a half inches tall, this tongue tube has been meticulously crafted by the hands of an unknown artist who most likely lived during the Shang Dynasty in China. It has been classified as one of the ceremonial jades, which are commonly excavated from tombs of the elite in China. The tongue was often found in high numbers with a bee disc, another type of ritual jade that can be seen in this exhibit. It is made of nephrite, which was the more valuable form of jade in ancient China. It is opaque with brown iron deposits that occur naturally in the nephrite. Um, in addition, the opacity of the, of the tsung may be attributed to extreme heating temperatures with fire before the burial at upwards of 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a common ritual practice that has been proven to cause nephrite to change color and become more opaque. Um, the height of the tsung is also significant because shorter, smaller tsung tubes like this one have been more commonly found in tombs of people who are of high status. Despite this, however, um, the highest, like the highest ranking members of the society are often found with longer and taller tongue tubes. Um, so therefore, this tongue was likely found with a lower ranking elite citizen. Um, the meaning and exact purpose of the tongue is currently un unknown. Um, but many researchers have come to similar conclusions. The most common explanation is that it was meant to aid the tomb occupant in their afterlife and to help their immortal soul reach their final resting place. The outside is square, which matches how the ancient Chinese depicted the earth and the inside is hollow and round like a circle, which symbolize the infinite heavens. Um, the reason I dated this piece to the late Shang dynasty is mainly because of the geometric patterns that wrap around each of the four sections of the tongue. And you can see, yeah, you can see them circled. Um, the pattern is displayed on each register. The pattern that is displayed on each register is a winding cloud pattern known as Yunwen or Leiwen in Chinese. This pattern is extremely common and meaningful to China. Chinese art and still frequently is displayed on a multitude of objects, both sacred and not. Um, furthermore, there are a lot of Shang and So dynasty bronzes that have been found bearing this cloud pattern, which serves as evidence for dating the Tsung in the late Shang dynasty. Um, because of when the piece was created, it is unclear what, if anything, these cloud patterns symbolize. However, Clouds in real life are physically between heaven and earth, which parallels the state of the deceased in the Yellow Springs between heaven and earth. So while this is interesting to think about, it is also likely that this piece was created too early for the patterns to actually bear that meaning. Um, nonetheless, the Tsung is a remarkable work of art, which remains a testament to the intricate funerary rituals of ancient China. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone. So I actually had two pieces. Um, so I had this uh, green jade gear blade and the uh, nephrite UA axe head pendant. I'm sorry, can you hear me all right? All right, great. <laughs> so stone weaponry pieces like the two of these are commonly found in burial sites or sites where rituals would have been performed. Though they both take the form of weapons, neither piece was crafted with the intent that they would be used for that purpose, hence the use of the stone and the blunted edges on both of the pieces. The weapons that they mirror in shape were both symbols of status and power in their original forms, but they have evolved to symbolize protection and safety as ceremonial objects. The symbolic significance of these pieces is directly tied to the shifting and evolving burial rituals present throughout Chinese history. 
the Jade Gear Blade is thought to have been created during the Eastern Han Dynasty from around 25 to 220 AD. However, it appears to be modeled off of the Jade Gear Blades, which were commonly used for ceremonial purposes during the Shang Dynasty over 1,000 years earlier. The blades feature decorative carvings, like the one found at the base of this blade, which features the Tao Tia mask motif, which is found throughout Chinese art during both the Shang and Han dynasties. The Tao Tia is a prominent mythological creature which features heavily on ritual items from the Shang dynasty, though its meaning and significance is not known definitively. Jade pieces, such as this one, have often been found in burial sites, like the famous Dayun Hill tombs, which were excavated at the beginning of the 21st century. Though this particular jade dagger was discovered far earlier, similar pieces, as well as larger jades, like jade coffins, were discovered in tombs in the Zuyi Jiangsu region of China. Likewise, the axe head pendant is also reminiscent of real weaponry from a far earlier time period. Its form is based off of the archaic Yue axes, which were powerful symbols of authority during that time. The carvings seen along the face of the pendant here are referred to by some as the stiff leaf pattern, which commonly decorated carvings and porcelains during the Ming period. Yue axes were used primarily for sacrificial rituals throughout ancient Chinese history, but other remaining examples were far more ornately decorated than what we see here. The pendant top features a Jui pattern, which symbolized well wishes for the recipient of the piece, suggesting that they were typically given as gifts. Though the pendant is made specifically using nephrite, which is a far more high quality stone, this piece too is classified as a jade. Thus, it's closely tied to the heavenly spiritual significance so often associated with jade, as was mentioned in earlier presentations. Though these pieces come from very different time periods in Chinese history, their designs are both reminiscent of ancient pieces with profound spiritual significance to the population. It is thought that they were placed within tombs in order to serve the deceased as they pass on to the next life, or to serve as protective talismans for the living as they both came in the shape of weaponry. It was common to put models of objects within burial sites instead of the objects themselves because it was believed to provide a necessary spiritual barrier between the living and the dead. The shape of the objects contrasts the beautiful and symbolic nature of the dark jade and the purple streaked nephrite as the materials were not as harsh as traditional metal weaponry would have been. Because pieces like this were used for ritual purposes, it is likely that they would have been owned by members of the upper echelons of society. So these pieces serve as tangible representations of the enduring tradition of Chinese spirituality and shows how artists have drawn inspiration from the same ideals for centuries. Thank you. Okay, um, is uh, Georgia Morgan here? Is it Georgia here today? Yeah, because Georgia emailed me earlier about some um, Wi-Fi problem at her area in Pennsylvania. So it looks like she's not here. Okay, so I'm going to uh, read uh, her uh, research. Her research is this uh, Jade B uh, disc. The Jade B disc of the Ming Dynasty with rows of uh, Gu Ding or green bumps it's a dull green jade with some yellow and light brown discoloration. The B disc rests on a wooden stand, which was added later by Professor Frank Kramer and features his name carved in Chinese. These jade B discs, owner's green, which is recognized as the main food in China, specifically through the Gu Ding design which refer to the green bump design on the front and back of the disc. The wrist surface, help, the wrist surface helps reflect light evenly and the B disc features a small band on the outer and the inner rim. Valued for his qualities of toughness, textures and attractive colors, jade was considered as an emblem of immortality a metaphor for human virtue and an expression of a spiritual and earthly powers. Jade as a medium had a crucial place in art and society, even being 
even being nicknamed the Stone of Heaven. The purpose of a jade bee discs in burials was to protect the body of the deceased and to guide them to the afterlife and were often placed on the chest, eyes, or mouth, which was a practice that began in the second half of the Eastern Zhou Dynasty around the 5th century BCE. The shape of the jade bee disc also played a key role in highlighting its importance. It represents the notion of a sky revolving around a central axis, a cosmological thinking formed around 300 BCE in China. Jade bee discs were also handled by shamans who were religious leaders of specifically the Liangzhu culture and serve as a transmitters of cosmological knowledge. So not only was the jade bee disc an important symbol of a culture wealth and artistic knowledge needed to make these objects, but it also reflected an understanding of the world and, co and the cosmic forces around them. The discs would have required skilled artisans to make sure that they were crafted evenly so that it was a perfect circle that would align with the hole in the center to reiterate the message that a sky revolves around a central axis. The jade bee discs were especially popular among elite burials because they conformed to the popular visual rules at the time, which highlighted a simple figure crafted from a prized material to be mostly virtually pleasing. Since the mineral was so difficult to carve, the work that went into creation carried his high status due to the, stren the strenuous manual labor associated with the B disc. It showed that it was carefully crafted and therefore was worthy of accompanying the deceased to their tombs and guiding them to their afterlife. The bee disc would have been made using tools made of a wood and a bamboo, as well as a sand-based abrasive to polish the surface. Another tool used was an emery wheel, which would have been mounted and used to cut the jade and outline its profile. The Hongshan culture used robes coated with emery and quad and the quartz crystals to create friction to cut through the jade. And this technique was used by the Liangzhu culture as well. Jade was wielded as more than just an elite good, but rather a symbol for the connection between the mortal realm and the heavenly realm, which solidifies his role in burials for the elite. Okay, <laughs> I hope I represent uh, Georgia well, <laughs> represent her research well, okay. <laughs> All right, DRG. Hello. Scene of celebration in a pavilion is an ink rubbing of a stone carving located at the Wu family shrines, a funerary complex located in the Shandong province of China. The complex has been traditionally attributed to the Wu family due to the inclusion of their family name on some stelae inscriptions. However, the inclusion of other family names raises questions as to whether all of the complex was intended for the Wu family. During the Han Dynasty, Chinese tombs shifted from wooden structures or earthen pits to stone tombs that often featured elaborate relief carvings. Rummings were then made of these carvings through a process where a thin sheet of paper is pressed into a carving with brushes. Ink is then rubbed onto the paper with a cloth in order to transfer the image. Multiple sets of ink rubbings of the Wu family shrines have been created, making it difficult to date this particular rubbing. Scene of celebration in a pavilion is one of three similar homage scenes found in three main stone chambers at the shrines. All of the homage scenes share most of the same elements with some minor changes. This work features two main registers. The bottom register contains a row of soldiers, chariots, and horses. The top register features a two-story pavilion. A male figure of importance, such as a patriarch or royal figure, sits in the center of the first floor as his attendants bow before him. The inclusion of a male elite reflects the patriarchal ideas of Confucianism and Taoism. Beliefs such as the concept of filial piety, or that sons should dedicate themselves to the care of their families and their fathers, places emphasis on men as opposed to women. 
a large crowd is gathered on the second floor. The central figure circled in red is most likely Shi Wang Mu, the Queen Mother of the West, a figure from Chinese mythology known for bearing a substance that brings immortality to those who consume it. The inclusion of her represents the desire to join her on her home of Mount Kunlun, a mountain traditionally associated with the heavens and become an immortal. She is often paired with Dong Wing Gong, the King Father of the East in funerary art from the Shandong region of China. Shi Wang Mu represents the feminine energy of Yin, while Dong Wing Gong represents the masculine energy of Yang in order to achieve the yin yang balance taught by both Confucianism and Taoism. In pre-Han dynasties, Shi Wang Mu was sometimes presented as a powerful seductress, which conflicted with the Confucian idea that women should be submissive and loyal to men. Placing her in a marriage transfers some of her power to her husband, therefore making her less threatening to the contemporary social order. The archer outside of the pavilion may be Yi, who is known for gaining the elixir of immortality from Shi Wang Wu after shooting down nine of the 10 suns in the sky. The Wu family was composed of multiple high-ranking government officials, which explains their grand funerary site. Building a funerary site such as this would also contribute to their public image because honoring deceased family members with lavish funerals was considered an important aspect of filial piety. The Wu family shrines may have been used as a site for ancestor worship by the Wu family. The reliefs also would have served a didactic purpose by showing Confucian and Taoist ideas to younger generations of the Wu family. This is just like, um, so one of the scholars on like the Wu family shrines created a 3D reconstruction of the shrine. So this is to give you a sense of where this would be located. In that like central niche in the very back is this carving and that's a zoom in. Thank you. Hi everyone, can you hear me all right? Okay. So the piece in front of you is a jade sculpture of Qiong Mu, the queen mother of the West with bird that stands around 18 centimeters tall and in person is only a little bit bigger than the palm of my hand. Qiong Mu loosely translate to the queen mother of the West in English. And she's shown here accompanied by two lotus flowers and a crane at her side and a cloudy emerald green jade. She is dressed in a traditional aristocratic robe that flares out at the bottom, emulating a blossoming flower, and her hair is carved into a neat spiraled bun. At first glance, this looks like an artifact that would be commonly found in a tomb of a person of high society in ancient China. However, there are a few elements to the piece that have caused suspicion about whether or not the artifact is authentic or if it was intended for sale among a Western audience. According to the special collections at Gettysburg, this piece was created in the Qin Dynasty um, and was heavily influenced by Confucianism, although she was originally a Taoist deity. The crane and lotus are next to Queen, both common in Chinese culture. Lotus flowers are originally shown next to hierarchical figures in Buddhist culture and rarely shown in Taoism and Confucianism. This is common among Chinese art that is solely created for Western markets and tourism. It's the act of combining different symbolic references from different Chinese cultures that lack context, but are aesthetically pleasing together. Moving away from the physical piece itself, the queen mother was the most powerful female deity in Chinese mythology. And this specific representation of Qi Wang Mu is significant considering that her image throughout Chinese history has changed completely from her initial story. Her identity and her femininity have evolved throughout history as a direct reflection of the social, spiritual, and political climate of various reigning dynasties. Originally thought to be a feral animalistic goddess of destruction, she was depicted in literature as having wild and unkempt hair and features that resembled wild animals like tigers. She attained the Tao, finding enlightenment through the teachings of Taoism, and the Queen Mother became the goddess of immortality in the later part of the Han Dynasty. Chinese immortality is slightly different from what Westerners perceive as living forever. The immortality granted to the followers of Qiong Mu is considered to be eternal life after death, where they would accompany her and her immortal beings forever. This particular sculpture shows the queen mother in rare form as she is not often shown by herself and other works of art. Her common companions are her children and her loyal followers. She's been said to live on top of the Kunlun mountain in Western China with a large council of advisory members. It is on this mountain that she tends to her gardens grows her peaches of immortality to ensure the longevity of those who are living beyond death. 
She was then stripped of her independence under the influence of Confucianism due to the need for a spiritual and societal balance that was introduced to the concept of yin and yang. She was married to Dong Long Gong who ruled the East and together they had numerous children. This new maternal role that the queen mother embodied in literature and art was a direct reference to the societal demands and stereotypes placed on women in more recent Chinese societies. She became the role, the role model for, for modern women and the stories that were told about her which has shaped women into being idealized versions of wives and mothers. What is truly unique and arguably the most important aspect of the queen mother's story is how the cultural climate of each dynasty directly impacted her narrative. And yet she still remains a pivotal character among Chinese mythology. Thank you. I think that concludes all the uh, public presentations. All right. So I guess now we'll um, invite uh, the listeners of the audience for questions. This is actually, first off, wonderful job, everyone. It's, it's so exciting to, to see what the directions that your uh, research took and then just to have you um, speak so knowledgeably about the different influences and the different styles and to question the pieces. I think it's just really fascinating. Um, I just have a, a fun question for Deidre. Uh, I just wanna know how cool was it to know that your piece is actually part of a larger tomb? So can you talk about that three-dimensional, uh, the tomb piece that you found that helped you understand where your piece fit inside that larger scape? So um, one of the first things that happened during my research is Professor Sun gave me a, well, recommended me a book that's called Recarving China's Past. And it's on the whole like Wu family shrine complex, which is really helpful because it has pictures of everything. And most of the carvings, they may not like directly relate to each, relate to each other, but it's definitely all part of a larger story. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are like historical stories. There's mythological stories. There's philosophical teachings. So seeing all those pieces in like context really helped. And then one of the people that wrote that book, like one of the main contributors on his website, he has this 3D reconstruction of like the whole shrine and like being able to like see it in that picture was really helpful, especially because I wasn't like totally sure how to express like this is like in a niche in like a mm. chamber and then there's this whole complex near it. it there's a lot going on, but yeah, <laughs> definitely getting like seeing all those pictures, seeing all those rubbings, seeing the 3D reconstruction, it definitely helps like piece together this larger story of the shrines. Great, thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, so I'll, I'll um, ask a, ask a, a question, um, um, well, other people are formulating. So again, a kind of just sort of general question about um, if you had had kind of more more time or access to more materials, what what else would you have included in the in the exhibition um, from you know either from from what you may have seen in special collections or in in your research, like other images of the Queen Mother that you came across or. Sorry, you cut out. Was that a question for me? Uh, or any, yeah, yeah, maybe for you, yeah, Georgia. Yeah, any, yeah, if there are other questions or other images, um, other <laughs> objects, if we had had maybe three three times the space or, and three times the staff. <laughs> um, I genuinely think that she's just such an interesting figure in Chinese mythology as a whole. Um, there's so much to her story that I've literally just probably scraped the surface after all of my research. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't even know what I would put in else. Um, I don't know, maybe Deirdre has a better answer, but I think just like more about her background, more about, um, I think that something that I'm really interested in is like how she was supposed to be this role model for women and how she kind of changed um, due to her like societal circumstances. And she's not even a real person. It's like, she's a, a figment and she gets put under all of these like societal pressures. Um, so I think that's something that's really interesting and like really unique that I found through my research. And I would like to go in more in depth on that. I would also love to see the um, the imperial or the clasp like 
in with an imperial robe, I think that would be really beautiful to kind of see um, since that some of these do have a, like use function or use value to kind of see them in, in their original context. So I have another question. When do you think with the cicada, when do you think those little holes were drilled in at the at the time it was made or would it or could it have been, could those little holes have been drilled in? Um, I'm gonna, I think that they were made when the sculpture was made. I don't think they were added later. When I first examined the piece, I was wondering, well, maybe they were drilled in later, um, you know, so that, even though it used to be a grave good, it could then be worn by the living. But in my research, I found that a lot of Ming Dynasty sculptures of cicadas do have holes in them and can be worn as a pendant or a brooch. So if, well, I, I do think that it is, um, Professor Soon keeps telling me to be more confident in my dating. So <laughs> if it is a Ming Dynasty piece, then I think the holes have probably always been there. Yeah. And, and Okay, yeah, I, I can add a little bit here just uh, uh, about, uh, you know, the um, jade from the, uh, I think it has been really a practice, you know, in uh, China that often the, um, you know, in later dynasties, you know, they rework, you know, the, uh, the jades from the earlier dynasties. Mm -hmm. And also there are cases, um, you know, uh, like late Neolithic jades, you know, were like the bee and the tone, you know, uh, discussed by Alisa and, you know, Georgia, they were actually found, you know, in Bronze Age tombs. So in other words, you know, uh, Neolithic, you know, jades, they were already collected actually by, you know, the upper elites, you know, during the Bronze Age, which is a very interesting, you know, um, I think, you know, practice and need to be studied. <laughs> And, and speaking of collectors, I don't think I really realized that the stand for the B disc has Kramer's name carved in it. What is the story behind that? Like where, where was it carved? When was it carved? Was it his idea <laughs> to kind of insert himself that way? No, no, um, I, I don't have all the details. I'm sorry, I don't have that with me uh, where I'm right now, uh, but it was actually a gift to Dr. Kramer. He um, already had the B disc. Mm -hmm. And then a friend of his actually thought it'd be a lovely tribute to actually have the stand built. Mm -hmm. So the stand was built and Dr. Kramer's name in Chinese was placed in the stand uh, to honor him. So it wasn't Dr. Kramer's idea at all. It was actually a lovely gift by someone else. So that, that B disc, which is a, obviously a beautiful piece, had the stand with Dr. Kramer's name on it um, as, a, as a thank you and remembrance for him. And Yan or, or, or um, whoever, if... if um... Where, what is that? Is that stand? Is that the design of the stand? Sort of generally pretty common for displaying the B discs, or is that just again another thing specific to Kramer? Um, I think that's a common actually uh, practice. The practice I would say started um, in the Ming Dynasty. You know, you may remember we had another exhibition for Chinese decorative arts. You know, last year. Uh, so that was the time period, you know, uh, archaic jades, you know, they were, you know, objectified, you know, they were displayed as a kind of art form. They were also studied, I think, by scholars, you know, during that time. And one thing, too, that it's hard to really kind of get across um, in the images, although the, the photographs are beautiful, is that uh, that surface pebbling, um, the rays, the bumps, on, on the bead disc are really amazing. So again, I hope everyone has a chance to, to come, come back um, and see the objects in person. It's beautiful. So again, feel free to um, type any questions or comments in the chat box too, if you prefer not to be on camera. Again, congratulations uh, to Yansoon. Thank you um, to, to Carolyn and Catherine and, um, uh, yeah, and Karen. And, um, and again, huge, huge congratulations 
um, to to our students and really to everyone for making it <laughs> making it through uh, the end of the semester. This is our last day of classes at Gettysburg College, and this is a wonderful way, uh, I think, to celebrate um, to celebrate this milestone. So um, again, thank you, thank you for for being here. Enjoy your weekend, and I hope to see you in Schmucker Art Gallery in February.